Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, sir. Julian Castro. Good hey, morning. Good, Good to be morning. With you. A presidential candidate with actual White House experience. That's rare nowadays. <laughs> we don't see that much. Yeah, I served Obama as a housing secretary. You was, yeah, the secretary of HUD, right? I was, yeah, yeah for the last two and a half years of the administration. Uh, and before that, I had been mayor of San Antonio for five years. So what was your job there and what did you do? as far as housing and urban development? At HUD, well, I mean, the mission of HUD really is to make sure that there are more affordable housing opportunities for people across the country, uh, whether it's public housing. come back and help us. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, here, you know, in New York, y'all have, like, a front row seat to some of the biggest challenges when it comes to affordable housing. There's so many people in this community uh, that are doubling up. You've also seen uh, homelessness going up, mm -hmm. right, over the last couple of years in a lot of communities. Um, HUD also deals with home ownership, making making sure that folks can afford to buy a home. Uh, so that's what I did for two and a half years. I was uh, the head of HUD, and I traveled to 100 different communities in 39 states, figuring out how we could be stronger partners so that people could have more housing opportunity. On the urban development side of it, it was really about making sure that people could rise up um, no matter what neighborhood they were living in, right? They could find opportunity, a better quality of life, so that they could reach their dreams. Is it true that Barack Obama called you while you was in a Panda Express? <laughs> I had just driven through the drive through at Panda Express. Yeah, it was like April 16th, 2014. And uh, you know, I, I looked at the phone, and you know how sometimes on your cell phone it says uh, unknown or block call. Yeah. It said private. So if you ever get a call that says private, yeah, it might be answer the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but was yeah, it yeah, him I just, on the line or was it his secretary? Uh, well, I think originally, you know, they say hold for the president. They, pa they yeah. patch you through. Right, right, right. Yeah, what yeah, it's not order? him. I mean, what made you I, answer? I thought, I said, what, what, what made, made you order? <laughs> <laughs> I was hungry. He was intrigued that something said block call. You never yeah. see it, or, or, or I mean private on there, you know. It never says private. It says unknown or block call or whatever. That's he, good. So does, you answer the phone when people call you because I don't answer calls. I don't know. So yeah, I, I got to start you know, doing unfortunately that. for everybody, including those of us who are politicians, that is true. Like nobody answers their cell phone anymore <laughs> if they don't recognize the number. Yeah. So when I'm dialing for dollars, like nobody's answering. Oh man. <laughs> did he did he ask you or did he tell you, look, you're taking this job? Uh, oh no, he asked, of course. Okay. Yeah. We we talked about the Spurs for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, of course he's a big uh NBA fan. And um and then he, he said, you know, that he was calling that if I'm interested in if I was interested in taking on this role. Do you think you did a good job? I do. Yeah, I feel like we accomplished a lot. You know, maybe the thing that I'm most proud of is we actually accomplished the most significant um, rule uh, to try and desegregate communities mm -hmm. ever since the 1968 Fair Housing Act. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, when the Trump administration came in a couple of years later, they put it on ice, but it was something called affirmatively furthering fair housing. And the idea was to communities receiving federal taxpayer dollar through HUD you had to get more serious about how you're going to create equal housing opportunity in your jurisdiction. Is oh. it disheartening to see some of the policies you guys put into place getting dismantled? For sure. Because, and not only that, I believe that um, this administration takes this attitude that if you're poor, there's something wrong with you. Hmm. I don't believe that just because you're poor that there's something wrong with you. Hmm. Um, in fact, I remember that uh, of the households that HUD helped, um, that 43% of those households that had somebody that was working age, somebody was working. So there are a lot of uh, people that are out there that are working that are smeared as somehow lazy or they don't want to work or that something's wrong with them. And I just completely disagree with that. Why doesn't HUD provide free housing for veterans? I always wondered that. Well, no, I mean, one of the big things that we did actually was that um, we had this, uh, uh, Obama had this, goal of ending veteran homelessness. Mm -hmm. And so um, between 2010 and 2016, veteran homelessness went down by 47%. Um, and actually, that's a, it's, it's an interesting story. This was one example of where Washington actually worked the way that you would hope it should work, right? Congress appropriated the money for vouchers for people to get housing. Um, you know, the president, the rest of us in the administration worked with mayors and governors to actually implement this program, housing authorities across the country. And over those six years, I mean, we almost uh, reduced veteran homelessness by half. Unfortunately, um, these last couple of years, it's gone back up. I don't understand that, man. Like, one of my biggest pet peeves is watching how America 
treats his veterans. Like I feel like veterans should be tax exempt. I feel like they should get yeah. free room and board and like a stipend every month just to be able to eat and pay their bills. Yeah, no, I mean, we definitely owe them a, a debt of gratitude. You know, recently, uh, just yesterday, I put out a, a bold immigration proposal. And one of the things that I addressed in that immigration proposal, for instance, is that there are a whole bunch of folks who have served our country, um, who served our country and they were undocumented, and then they got deported. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there's there are uh, so many folks who are living in Mexico right now who are veterans who have gotten deported, who served honorably, who should be allowed to come into this country because they served it in the military. That's you know, great. a lot of people don't don't necessarily know what HUD does and how can HUD affect and help people. A lot of people have no clue, and especially when people are trying to buy homes. So for people that don't know, can you explain how HUD can help somebody and what they need to do? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, HUD works with housing authorities, for instance, that provide public housing. Mm-hmm. It's also the agency that funds um, what people commonly know as Section 8, mm-hmm. right, vouchers so that people can go and rent uh, apartments or houses throughout a metro area. Um, it also has something called the FHA. Uh, the FHA used to be part of the problem. When it was created in 1934, it sanctioned redlining, basically sanctioned discrimination, mm-hmm. um, kept out African Americans. Uh, but today, actually, by the end of the Obama administration, about 45% of new homeowners who were black had an FHA-insured mortgage. I love that. Right? right? So it actually has become one of the biggest tools that we have for empowering and making homeownership possible for communities of color. And a lot of those, for people that that's out there listening, a lot of those, you don't need to put anything down. Like there's so many different grants and so many different things that you guys help where people don't necessarily have to put money down as a, as a down payment. Yeah, I mean, for FHA, you know, the difference is with a conventional mortgage, if it's not FHA backed, you have to put 20% down. 20. Uh, if it's FHA backed, it's about 3%. And, and then that. if there are other programs, sometimes you can get that lower. For veterans, actually, um, uh, under the VA, um, in many cases, it's 0%. Zero money down, and yeah. so that makes home ownership a lot more possible. Right. You had you had a you got a plan to decriminalize illegal entry into the country, right? I do. I um, agree with that a hundred percent too, uh, because a lot of times people look at it, uh, they don't realize a lot of people are coming here because they're trying to flee from a situation. There's women, there's kids, and they shouldn't be criminals because they try to get into the United States. And a lot of times people come here and they want to be able to come here legally, but you have to get here first to seek asylum. So it's not like you're breaking the law necessarily. Well, what's the plan? Yeah, so my plan is basically uh, not to treat these folks like criminals. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it used to be basically that before 2004, uh, we treated this as a civil a penalty, civil mm-hmm. violation, not criminal. And I want us to go back to handling it that way. Uh, I also, you know, I don't buy the BS of this administration that a whole bunch of women and children, families that are fleeing dangerous situations in Honduras, or El Salvador, Guatemala, present a danger to this country. They don't. Um, This president told us about a year ago that if we could just be cruel enough to take away little children from their mothers, that that would stop, that would deter more families from coming. And instead, today, more families are coming than before. So cruelty has failed. Mm -hmm. I want us to choose compassion. You know, we have a border that um, is more secure than it's ever been. We can continue to make investments so that it may it, it stays secure, but there's no reason that we should be treating people like criminals. Kids are dying. I was just reading about another kid that, that had the flu that ended up dying in detention center. It's awful. Well, and what was worse was that uh, there's a, a Jacqueline, I think, uh, Gal or Kael, um, seven years old. Uh, she died in CBP custody uh, with her father. Uh, and they did an autopsy and they determined that the reason that she died was because of an infection that killed her. Uh, The president a few days ago suggested that her father had taken the blame because she was dehydrated, that he had basically admitted that it was his fault, which was a complete lie. And another instance- The president lies? Yeah, I know, right? (laughs) But but, I mean, think about that. Just I would ask folks for a second. What kind of person are you when you're willing to lie about the death of a seven-year-old girl and her grieving father? I mean- that's how far low this man has sunk. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I'm not much into trying to make this country anything again. I want this country to be better than it ever has been before. But the thing that I do want to restore 
is I want to restore integrity and honesty and dignity to the Oval Office. Let me, I got to be honest with you right now. Hold on one second. Oh, give me this. What is he doing? It's really. That ash on your little hand is like killing me, right? You got a little, <laughs> that was too much lotion that? you just gave him. That's it's, it's right there in the put... corner. Yeah, right oh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Come on, it's distracting me. That ash been distracting me since the interview started. It's the like, white been distracting you? It's because I'm it, getting I, old, man. I'm yeah, 44 I mean, I, already. I want yeah. you to keep moist. I like to be moist. Rub it in. There you go, Mr. Cafe. You, <laughs> you gave go. me too much. You want to help me? Give me some back. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. Jesus. Now, how serious is the crisis at the border? If, if, if. Well, look, we had 100,000 people that came last last month. Okay. And so, um, from my mind, what we need to do is, um, you know, we need to make sure that uh, we treat people like human beings, we treat them with compassion, and also um, that we have a way to process their claims of asylum. Right now, the, the uh, folks at the border, the U.S. government is playing games with them. It's blocking the ports of entry for them, not allowing them to assert asylum. Uh, on top of that, instead of putting them into cages, we need to figure out an orderly way for them to be housed, not detained, not jailed, but but housed, sheltered, uh, until their processes, their their claims can be processed. And you know, uh, pe- some people have asked uh, when I proposed this immigration plan yesterday. Well, mm-hmm. is this open borders? And I said, no, that's a Republican talking point. Um, of course, deportation is still an option. But I believe that people should be treated as human beings. Right, because nobody disagrees that it needs to be border security. It's just that's right. how and what. That's right. Of course, you know, we have 654 miles of fencing already on the border. We have a lot of personnel down there on the border. We have uh, boats that patrol the river. We have helicopters. We have planes. Um, we have all sorts of technology, cameras that are monitoring what's happening at the border. We have a border that is more secure than mm-hmm. it ever has been, and we're going to maintain that security. But how we treat the people, and this is why I call my plan people first mm-hmm. immigration mm-hmm. policy, right? Um, because it's focused on the people. They imagine say that, but, imagine oh, the long-term effects, too, that this has on people. Like when they get detained, some people are there for months at a time, kids. You know, the long-term effects of being separated from your families. What is that going to do for people mentally? Like you have no idea what that's even going to be like further on down the line. Yeah, you're right. I mean, psychologists have said that uh, being separated uh, from uh, your parents like that, that that can cause long-term emotional damage to a child. You know, I grew up with a grandmother that came across the border in 1922 when she was seven years old with her little sister wow. because their parents had died. Mm. And um, before she left with her closest relatives, she never had a chance to say goodbye to her mom. And so my brother Joaquin and I, when we were growing up, you know, she was 70 years old, 72 years old, and she would still cry like a little girl when she thought about leaving her mom. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, you could tell. I mean, that was a circumstance where she was with her relatives and, and it was well-intentioned. You can only imagine a child who was seven years old, eight years old, and all of a sudden they're, they're separated from their parents. And some of these children still have not been reunited with their parents. And so the federal government needs to do everything humanly possible to reunite, reunite these families Congress, I'm glad, will investigate thoroughly what went wrong. And I think that people, you know, should be punished by losing their jobs, at least. Is it true that, because uh, they always, one of the talking points from the conservatives is that Obama administration, Obama administration deported more illegal immigrants than any sitting president? In, in the first few years of the Obama administration, the number of deportations was higher than it had been in the Bush administration and the Clinton administration. You know, I think the Obama administration got better about the issue of immigration mm-hmm. as the years went by. Um, in 2012, uh, you know, it, the executive order, DACA, that all of us know that address dreamers was instituted. And then in 2014, in November of 2014, DAPA, um, which got blocked up in the courts. But, you know, yeah, it, I mean, I think it's true that the administration, over time, it got better. At one time, the number of deportations was, I think, you know, two or three million. So why do people get mad at Trump if o- President Obama was doing the same thing? Well, I wouldn't say that Obama was doing uh, the same thing because um, Trump has a level of cruelty Mm. toward these families that is directed at them. Um, Also, this zero tolerance policy was was, uh, amped up from anything that the Obama administration did. Um, Also, this 
president began his campaign by suggesting that Mexico was sending rapists and drug Murders. runners. Uh, and you'll remember that he said of that um, American-born judge uh, who was of mm -hmm. Mexican descent that he couldn't do his job because right. he was Mexican. Mm -hmm. So there's a clear animus that this president has demonstrated toward Mexicans, Latin Americans, people are coming across the border that Barack Obama never engaged in that kind of talk and in fact spoke on many instances about the value of immigrants in a very in a very humane way. Um, I'm not saying that I agreed with everything that the Obama administration did during that time. You know, I, when I was mayor of San Antonio in 2014, I did express a critique of it, but but it was night and day in mm -hmm. terms of how President Obama looked at immigrants and how Donald Trump does. Now, what what laws would you put back in play if you become president? That I'm sure Trump has taken out that Barack Obama put into play when he was in office. Well, I mean, I would the first executive order that I would sign if I'm president on the afternoon of January 20th would be to recommit the United States to the Paris Climate Accord so that we lead again on climate change. Um, I would, I believe that we need to go to a, a, a system where everybody gets Medicare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, however, at the same time, I mean, the first order of business is repairing the damage that this president has done to, to the Affordable Care Act uh, because more than a million people have already lost coverage because they're trying to sabotage our health care system. A lot of people who voted for him. Actually. Yeah, a lot of folks who voted for him, and you know, hopefully they'll recognize that when 2020 comes around again. So there are, you know, whether it's uh, the environment, whether it's health care, um, education, a number of things, housing, as we talked about, that mm -hmm. affirmatively furthering for housing rule, the next president is going to have to take us in the right direction of an America where everybody can prosper and not just you know, the super wealthy or people that this president likes or doesn't like or people that he considers his supporters. Why well, has this administration so hell been on reversing Obama's policies? Well, I think for two reasons. Uh, you know, statement. I think that he <laughs> he thinks that plays well to a mm -hmm. base of 37 percent that helped him win a narrow electoral college victory because he lost the popular vote. Um, and also sometimes it seems like he's doing that out of spite. Yeah. You know, yeah. out of personal spite. Um so, but it, it's going to be up to the next president, right, um, to try and bring the country back together as much as we can um, and to get us on the right track and to look to the future and not the past. I loved when you was on, uh, I believe it was with Jay Tapper, and he asked you about Bernie Sanders' stance on reparations, and you said, why wouldn't you compensate people who are actual property? Why, why wouldn't they? Well, I believe that we should, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, people ask me about reparations, and I said, you know, that under our Constitution that we compensate somebody if we take their property. So why wouldn't you compensate somebody if they actually were property mm -hmm. as sanctioned mm -hmm. by the state? That's a bar. And then some folks say, oh, well, you know, nobody that's alive today was, was enslaved. And I said, you know, well, you know, let me address that just for a second as a legal matter. Um, even though there's so much more humanity that we should talk about. Um, you know, if, if you had a piece of property and the government took it away from you today and then you passed away tomorrow, your estate would still be able to pursue a claim Absolutely. against the government mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for taking that property, all right? So why shouldn't the descendants, descendants of slaves still have a claim um, with regard to the federal government against the government for the grave injustice the original sin of slavery in this nation. Um, what I've also said is that I support Sheila Jackson Lee's legislation to a, to appoint uh, to do a study and appoint a commission on reparations mm -hmm. um, to assemble a group of people who understand this issue, who have the respect of communities around the nation, and then to make a recommendation to the president and to the Congress on how we can best address reparations. Um, and I think we need to do it that way because part of the process is in healing. Absolutely. You know, I think that it's a healing process um, for everybody in this country, right? And some people say, well, aren't you just stuck in the past? And I say, it is about the past, but it's really about the future. Yeah, because, because a lot of those socioeconomic gaps were created because of slavery. Like, they're still affecting us to this day. Yeah, and and I'm not convinced that we're ever going to fully come together as one nation, mm -hmm. like heal, mm -hmm. uh, until we address that original sin 
of slavery. Yeah, and, and it was just, it's a systemic sin. It was systemically done. So if it was systemically done to put us in that situation, something should be systemically done to get us out. Yeah, and you know, I, I uh, talked earlier about the FHA, right? right, right that was right. another great example of, there's a long legacy Education. Of, of oppressing and suppressing people. And, um, and our charge, the charge of this generation in the years to come, I think, is, uh, is how can we um, make sure that everybody can prosper and do it in a way that this country heals? And far from being, I know that some people have said, well, this is controversial or this is divisive. But at the end of the day, I think it actually leads to a stronger country. And what about marijuana? We talked a lot about it, and so many of us have been locked up, and our family members have been locked up for marijuana. Uh, what, do, what do you think about a marijuana bill and legalizing marijuana? No, I support it. Um, I think that we have good examples in places like Colorado of how you can do that. Obviously, it's going to be regulated, mm-hmm. right? You, and it, the regulation of it needs to be thoughtful. It has to be that, you know, that our own community can actually invest and own some of these dispensaries in some of these places. Yeah, no, I, you know, I hope that, uh, that that's one of the outcomes, right? Uh, small business opportunities, mm-hmm. um, folks from neighborhoods across uh, urban communities in the country that are able to benefit because of it. Um, you know, I also think that we need to look at people who have been incarcerated uh, because of marijuana possession, and I'm a fan of some of these jurisdictions that have gone backward mm-hmm. um, to try and expunge records mm-hmm. because there have been so many people, especially in communities of color, that have ended up incarcerated mm-hmm. and serving time in jail um, you know, for relatively minor offenses mm-hmm. and for marijuana that in some states is already legal. Right. And so um, we need to do that. We need to build on that First Step Act that was just passed uh, so we continue to reform our justice system. Um, I think we need to do things like invest more in our public defender system. We need to continue the work of the task force that President Obama set up on policing in the 21st century. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Charleston, South Carolina. and it's I my was, birthplace. No, oh, is that right? Yes, it's sir. a great town, man. Yes, sir. Um, I was two blocks away from the Mother Emanuel AME mm-hmm. Church. And, uh, of course, in 2015, Dylan Roof, went into the church and he murdered nine people. And mm-hmm. I said, you know, if Dylan Roof can do that and then a few hours later be apprehended without incident, as he should be. And given uh, Burger King. Yeah, well, then what about Eric Garner? And yeah. what about Stephon Clark? Mm-hmm. And what about Walter Scott? And what about uh, Michael Brown? And what about Sandra Bland? Yeah. Um, we need to make sure that police departments across this country treat everybody the same, no matter the color of your skin or what neighborhood you live in. And um, that's going to take continued reform. And the good news is that, uh, you know, I do think that we have work that we can build on. Um, I think that there are some police departments out there that have been uh, willing to make reforms. Mm-hmm. And um, and if I'm president, I'm going to push so that we can do that. What does what? that reform look like? Like, what are some things that you can say, this has been positive, I've seen this work? Uh, this- well, I mean, I think body cams is a very you know, straightforward example that people can understand. It's increased accountability. Um, It's, I think, made situations more clear, both from the officer's perspective and also from the perspective of somebody But officers still get off, though. Yeah, we got to be able to get that footage. And and that's why it is important, right, that you do see more officers being held accountable, Mm -hmm. right, Um, in the last few years. But I agree with you that for the longest time, even when the evidence seemed to be overwhelming, Juries would not hold an officer accountable. Right. Um, of course, no matter who you are, if you're an officer, everybody deserves a fair day in court. Um, but the problem was that it seemed like the deck was so stacked mm-hmm. against anybody who, uh, I mean, for anybody, any officer that was accused. So we need to make sure that the, the jury system um, is fair to everybody. Uh, and we do see some progress, but I agree that there's still a lot of work to do. There. What about for our HBCUs? I know a lot of programs they were saying it was taking, not giving the money to the HBCUs, and you know our community absolutely positively still needs the HBCUs. Absolutely, and um, shout to him. You know, I'm proud that uh, when I was mayor of San Antonio, we had on the east side of San Antonio um, one of the few institutions that was both uh, an HBCU and an HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution. Mm. Uh, and so I know the wonderful opportunities that that HBCUs have produced. And when you think about it, you know, today we have 
this 21st century global economy that requires more knowledge and more skill than ever before. And the communities that have gotten left out, especially the black community, um, now is the time when we need to be investing in their ability to thrive and to get the knowledge and the skill to compete in this 21st century global economy. Because I mean, you look at what's happening in countries like China or India, where they're producing tons and tons of young people that are well-educated and intelligent and hungry and ambitious and creative. Like in that world, um, we don't have anybody to waste. We don't have a single person to waste. Right? We need everybody's talent. And so I've supported, I support, and when I was mayor, um, you know, helped raise money for efforts to make sure that um, that young African Americans and Latinos have more higher education opportunity. I know you. I know you got to go, but why do you think there hasn't been a, a, a more viable Black and Brown coalition in this country? Because I feel like there's scrimp in numbers, and we have a lot of the same issues. So why wouldn't we like come together? Like, how can we make that happen? Well, I mean, I think that um, that there's always an opportunity. I I do think. Uh, you know, that you have instances in local politics where uh, some mayors over the years have made that happen. I'm thinking of, you know, like Tom Bradley in Los mm -hmm. Angeles when he was mayor, um, uh, a number of other mayors across the country. Um, also, we have a president today that is trying to pit these two communities against each other. Mm -hmm. And I think our in interests are so much more aligned. And my hope is that going forward, we can have those kind of coalitions. I'm going right now to, to NAN, to the National Action Network, and I know that Reverend Sharpling yes. mm -hmm. has made a lot of efforts over the years to bring these two communities and other communities together, and uh, I hope to be a part of that. How do we know what you're really here and it's not your twin brother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he says that I'm like a minute uglier than he is, okay. all right? But he grew a beard that he <laughs> shaved off like two days ago. When he had that beard, he looked a whole lot uglier than me. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would you consider him as your running mate? He's my dream running mate. I wish that I could, but you know, <laughs> under under the Constitution, <laughs> you cannot have two people from the same state run on the ticket, or if you win, you can't take those electoral votes. And if I'm the nominee, I expect to win my home state of Texas, which is 38 electoral votes. And you know, I gotta jettison my brother because I just can't afford to lose. There's 38 electoral votes. <laughs> now, before you leave, you said Trump's policy is gonna have America begging for immigrants in the future. What, what does that mean? Yeah, is that um, you know I said last night that this probably sounds politically incorrect to a lot of folks on the right, but the fact is that we need a lot of these immigrants. Absolutely. Whether it's agriculture, whether it's the hospitality industry, a number of other industries, um, our unemployment rate is at 3.8, 3.9 um, we need their talent, um, their effort, and our uh, birth rate is declining. Baby boomers in record numbers are drawing down from Social Security. We see countries around the world that have an aging population. We're going to have an aging population. So I said, if we're not careful, in 20 to 30 years, if we don't get this right, we're going to be begging for immigrants. Right? America we was need built to get by immigrants. Right. It was. Yeah, it was. And and in the 21st century, um, I think that victory is going to go to nations that can harness the power of talent from around the world and, of course, still make all the investments we need to make to make sure that our folks who are, are uh, here, who are born in the United States, get a good education, get good health care, you know, are able to get great job opportunities but also that we recognize the value of immigrants. Would America be here without immigrants? Like of what course if, not, What yeah. have white people built? What have what? What have white people built? Well, I mean, you know, uh, they've been a part of building up this country, you know? They've been an part. I, you know, I mean, people from Europe have been an important part of building up this country, but people from all over the world have been an important part of building up this country. We built this country. Well, thank built you. on the backs of slaves. They're trying to build a wall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I agree with you there. I mean, yeah. it, this a lot of this country was built uh, on the back of slave labor. And as we were talking about earlier, we have never fully accounted for that. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. My man. Well, thank you thank for you. joining us. We appreciate it. Oh, give, okay. me, give me your email and stuff, because I, I heard you having problems with the donations. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, uh, I haven't hit that 65,000 donation or contribution threshold um, that you have to to guarantee that you're going to be in one of these democratic debates. And so my website is julianforthefuture.com. 
And I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, Facebook. So find us, and uh, hopefully folks can make a contribution. So 65 grand? 65, no, 65,000 unique contributions. So different yeah, people. Yeah. No, I, I definitely raised, yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've raised more than that. Um, <laughs> but no, I, um, you know, I, I've said I wasn't born a front runner. I didn't grow up a front runner on the west side of San Antonio. Um, a lot of people out there uh, are not, don't feel like they're front runners. But I'm going to do what, he, what we do, what our families do. I'm going to go work hard. And I believe that by the time the Iowa caucus comes around in February of 2020, that I can be a front runner. Okay. Right. Well, Julian Castro, I appreciate you for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. All right. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.